May only the truth be spoken here, and may only the truth be heard. Amen. Please be seated. Nobody likes waiting. As a father of three, the impatience of a toddler is something I have dealt with three times over. There's lots and lots of children's books about waiting, waiting for lunch, waiting for a birthday, waiting for anything at all. Some of you who are parents or grandparents, you may have lines from some of these books stuck in your head as I do, in an interminable migraine-inducing rhyming loop. Songs like, and books like Llama Llama, Red Pajama, Waiting Waiting for His Mama. Unfortunately, our aversion to waiting isn't just some kind of childhood allergy that we grow out of. Us adults are pretty bad at waiting also. Waiting is an ask we make of others. Please bear with me. We even characterize waiting as an imposition that others place upon us. How dare they? It's like an injustice, something that we have a right against. We ask others to please honor our time, not to prolong the agony of having to wait for somebody else. We demand not to be kept waiting. Time is money. More specifically, my time is my money. The biggest problem with waiting is boredom. We all recognize that waiting can be pretty boring. Corporations and businesses inundate us with displays and electronic screens while we're waiting in line to distract us from the fact that we are waiting passively and not actually doing anything. Well, today we often can't bear to wait in boredom even for a second. This is why all of us in our pockets have access to the greatest distraction device created in human history, the smartphone. When we're not allowed to use our phones, like in airport immigration lines, we become like screaming toddler llamas waiting for mama all over again. We're just not very good at waiting. The other problem with waiting that's often described in academic literature is what they call lack of feedback. It's when we can't see what's going on, we don't know how long we have to wait, and we don't know if we're gonna get the thing we're waiting for at all. In the early days of computing, the Xerox company first used a little hourglass to indicate that there was a processing delay. Today, in our hardware, our software, our websites, we have spinning icons, rotating hourglasses, flashing cursors, progress bars, all of which tell us something is going on and you better wait. Behavioral research suggests that we are willing to wait three times longer when we see a little spinning disk as opposed to when we don't see any. So our expectations are being manipulated through this false feedback. Scholars have claimed that theme parks like Disneyland, they systematically overestimate how long you have to wait for a ride. So that when you get to the end of the queue after an hour, instead of an hour and a half, you feel like they're doing a great job and funneling you along faster than you expected. Other research have identified that progress bars for downloading or installing documents or applications are often engineered to move more slowly at the beginning, but much faster near the end, to lull us into thinking that, wow, things are moving right along faster than I thought, ahead of schedule, right? Even as our files, our applications, and our websites constantly fail to load at all. So all of this psychological and sociological research suggests that we're bad at waiting, we're easily distracted, we get frustrated, and it's really easy to manipulate us. But today's epistle and gospel both command us to wait. And they command us to do some of the most difficult waiting of all. St. Paul tells us here in his letter, first letter to the Thessalonians that we are to wait for the day of the Lord which comes like a thief in the night when we least expect it. In Matthew 24, just before 
our gospel text for today, Jesus tells his disciples to wait for the Son of Man to return at an unexpected hour, and that day and hour will be, when that day and hour will be, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Today we have a parable about a master who goes away for a long time and three servants who are waiting. In, these, in this text, we're being taught about what it means to wait when it's hard, to stay alert, to avoid distractions, even as we have no estimate of how long we have to wait and no feedback. There's no spinning rainbow disc, no progress bar, no clue as to how long the wait has to be. The parable of the talents isn't about our talents at all, although it is the source of our English word talent. It isn't about investments, banking, interest rates, or even about money in general. It's a parable about waiting well, waiting faithfully, waiting actively, having received already God's immense grace. This passage appears in the last of five discourses that frame the entire gospel according to St. Matthew. It's the last discourse. It's often called the Olivet Discourse because it happens on the Mount of Olives when Jesus is teaching his disciples just before he is arrested, tried, tortured, crucified on the cross. So the entire context of this discourse is that Jesus is about to give us the gift of forgiveness and salvation on the cross. All of the parables in this discourse are about how we are to wait for his second coming. The parable of the talents then reminds us that we have all received this incalculable gift of God's grace through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. A talent is a measure of weight for money used in the ancient Roman world. It represents a lot of money. One talent is roughly $2 million in today's currency. None of these three slaves earned or deserved any of this money. All of them received their talents through the generosity of the master, nothing more, nothing less. We aren't told what the first two slaves did with the five and the two talents that they received. We're simply told that they traded with them and they both doubled the number of talents. The first servant didn't earn five talents because he was somehow three talents better than the second servant. He earned five talents because he started with five talents and the other earned two because he started with two. The rate of return was the same for both in proportion to what they had received through the generosity of the master. The third servant, on the other hand, failed to wait patiently and faithfully after having received the same grace. He didn't lose the one talent he had received. He dug a hole and hid it underground. Ironically, in the Babylonian Talmud and in other rabbinic texts, we're told that one who properly hides money from sight, including by burying it, is not to be blamed if the money is later lost or stolen. So he did what was expected in a way, or what was prudent. But the master describes him as wicked and lazy. Now why? The third servant was wicked because he had the entirely wrong view of the nature and character of his master, who is Christ, our savior. In the parable, the master is the opposite of the third slave's characterizations. He isn't a harsh man. He praises the first two slaves graciously, invites them to enter into his joy, promises more than they even have uh, which is an abundance. And unlike what the third servant says, the master does not reap where he didn't sow. He gave the slaves their five, two, and one talents, respectively, 
and he settled his accounts with them. He settled accounts where he had sown and already given so much. The third slave was wicked by substituting his own mistaken view of Jesus Christ for the reality of the one who was arrested, tortured, and killed right after the end of this discourse. The third slave was also lazy because he was waiting passively in fear and not actively with confidence. The Greek word that's translated lazy here has more of a sense of reluctance and hesitance. So lazy in the sense of being unwilling to step up and do what you're supposed to do, do what was needed. The slave chose security by hiding the talent for fear of losing it. He buried it on the ground so that he wouldn't have any liability even if someone had dug it up and stolen it. In that sense, he didn't really fully receive what he had been given. He didn't accept wholeheartedly with gratitude the generosity of the master. He kept his distance from what he had received by hiding it away, burying it, not making it a part of his life and activity. He had no real response to the mercy and love that he had been shown. His laziness or hesitation was out of fear of being blamed when neither him nor any of the other slaves had earned any part of the talents they had received in the first place. We're two weeks out of Advent. We're in the season of active waiting as we approach this end of the liturgical year. The Anglican priest Fleming Rutledge has argued that Advent, the season of waiting for Christ's return, really begins with all saints. So we're right in the thick of pre-Advent, if you will, commands to keep awake, to be ready, remain watchful, are all over today's epistle and repeated throughout the Olivet Discourse. At Gethsemane, Jesus tells the disciples to stay awake, but returns from prayer to find them sleeping, not once, not twice, but three times. The failure of the disciples to keep watch at Gethsemane and the failure of the third servant to wait faithfully is a warning to us all. The vigil for Christ's second coming is ours to keep. And we never know when the master will return to settle accounts. If the biggest challenges of ordinary waiting are boredom and lack of certainty or feedback, then Christ has not left us with an impossible task. We won't be bored while we wait. We can't be bored. The parable of the talents teaches us that if we have truly received the grace of Christ, as long as we don't get distracted by this world, we will have much to do. For the master of the house, the creator of the universe and the world, has left us with the task of putting the grace we have received to work. In other words, of sharing it with others. We are to wait as the salt of the earth, as the light of the world that should not and cannot be hidden, as the talents of money that should not remain buried underground, but used. We are to wait while actively bearing witness to Christ, to forgive one another as we have been forgiven, and to love one another because he first loved us. There's too much to do for us to be bored. The only question is, have we become distracted by the actual and metaphorical smartphones that we carry around with us? Can we put those phones away and concentrate on what Christ has left us? The legacy of his grace and sacrifice on the cross. If we understand the nature of what Christ has already given us, if we understand how loving and gracious God is, then we can wait alertly and actively just like the first two slaves, and not fearfully and passively like the third. 
because we don't wait in doubt and uncertainty without feedback. We wait in the assurance of hope. Christ has borne the weight of uncertainty for us. We haven't been given maybes and probablys or kind ofs in Christ. We are promised that the Son of Man will return in power. The Master will come back in glory. In Christ, we can stay awake because our hope is secure. So we don't need a spinning disk. We don't need a progress bar. We know all that we need to know. We know that all believers will be gathered to Christ when he returns. We know that God is steadfast and faithful and that his word will be fulfilled. In Revelation 21, we are promised that the first heaven and the first earth will pass away, but God will make all things new. In the new heaven and the new earth, we will dwell with God, we will be his people, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. So we have all we need to wait faithfully and vigilantly. We wait because we have already received so much by God's grace, because we know that God is faithful and that Christ's return is certain. We wait because this is the most important vigil of our lives. As a psalmist wrote in Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning more than those who watch for the morning. Amen.